The Centre for Holocaust Education recommended in 2009 in that report that we need to better align what teachers know with the development of teaching. The call for improved subject knowledge, which I'm sure and is correct is, is weakening too many teachers about the subject, was set alongside the need to support stimulating critical discussion. So here you have vital, important, relevant and deep content that creates great opportunities for deep learning and really powerful teaching but isn't being necessarily used in that way. Alice uh, Pettigrew, who works at the Institute in the team, um, wrote a really fascinating paper for me. And there's a great quote, which I'll, I'll just read out to you. My point being that there is an important opportunity here to really interrogate what students and their teachers know or don't know, feel or believe about the Holocaust, and to use that information as a baseline for deliberation on critically important questions that have remained unanswered throughout its formal history in the curriculum. What is Holocaust education actually for? Well, to answer that question, I'll turn to another member of that team who puts it far better than I can in Paul Salmons. You can't interpret the world without an understanding of the Holocaust. So here we have it. We have a vital piece of knowledge that is about children interpreting the world as it is, and yet we're not necessarily and reliably using that knowledge to support great teaching. So the evidence indicates that we're not going deep. We're not engaging with the subject in ways that give children the chance to, in Paul's words, interpret their world, which in many ways you could argue is more important today than it's been for many, many years. But you need to understand the history in order to understand the present and the future. Now, this is because, in my view, content doesn't stand alone. No matter how powerful, how important, how relevant, in every classroom, content sits in a holy trinity with three other fundamental relationships. How we teach, what we teach, and the kind of place we create. For those that know their education history, that's a paraphrase of Dewey who always used to argue that a school is basically three things. What you teach, how you teach, the kind of place you are. But I want to talk about how we teach and why it is that with this fantastically rich and important and vital content, we still find it hard to teach in a way which promotes and builds the kind of interpretation, the kind of critical if reflection inquiry we want to see in children. Now, my evidence for that point, by the way, comes back to the survey, that when you look at the way that children answered some of the vital questions, what happened if you wouldn't participate, who was responsible, what percentage of people in Germany were Jewish, all these questions revealed, in some ways, a sad and unfortunate failure to really understand important and vital facts. And I'm going to suggest that's about the way the knowledge was taught. So three propositions as I go forward. How to teach is every, every bit as important as what we teach. We need to apply more reliably what we know about effective teaching if we're going to make any teaching, this or any other teaching, memorable, which is the task. We know much more about effective teaching than we think we do, but there, for a whole set of reasons around ideology and the denuding the professions of teachers in this country, that knowledge isn't accessible and hasn't been made available to teachers in their practice. Teaching has not, unfortunately, evolved today in England as an evidence-based profession. That's to the detriment of everybody, children and teachers and our nation. And finally, the third proposition is going to be that evidence doesn't stand alone. You, no good just citing the evidence, because evidence on its own doesn't make a difference. It's got to be mobilised with the right kind of incentives and challenges that demand and support its application. The hope, though, in all of this, I think, lies in the uh, recommendations set out again in the 2009 report. And many of the people here... Um, are part of the hope. But it's not yet been fulfilled, and that is that schools learn to work much more closely with lead schools, what you might call beacon schools, in networks of schools. Schools need to learn from each other because that's where the capacity now lies within the school system, and it is a battle for capacity. As I conclude, the UCL report reinforces my view that if we want to teach what matters better, if we want to ensure that every child gets their right to a great education, and if we're going to tackle the biggest issue in English education, actually, which is the fantastically shameful gap we have in outcomes for children from disadvantaged families, we need to address just three simple priorities. The first is the trust. We do need to build much more trust at every level of our system and for the system itself by demonstrating our professional standing and our knowledge and expertise as being evidence and lit literate as a profession. The second is wisdom. We need to bring much more knowledge, evidence, and informed judgment. It's not just RCTs. It is informed judgment. It is our wisdom to the system to tackle these deep and intractable problems. We have to teach this knowledge right. 
We have to teach many things better. There are deep problems that we just aren't solving. The system is not getting better, and it's certainly not getting better fast enough. And thirdly, we need to think about responsibility, which I'm now substituting for accountability. We need to move beyond the confines of accountability frameworks where people are constantly gaming something done to them. And we need to encourage greater personal responsibility, shared collective and personal responsibility to provide the very best education for all of our children. <laughs>